This is Mac Voices TV. Welcome to Mac Voices TV. This is the Talk of the Mac community, and I'm Chuck Joyner. Folks, we're just a few days past the uh, announcement of the iPad 2, and a lot of people seem very happy, very excited about this, but our guest this time around wasn't quite as excited as the rest, so we thought he'd, we would get him on to uh, beat him up, I mean question him a little bit about this, uh, Mr. John Marlero of the Mac Observer. John, welcome to Mac Voices TV. Hey, Chuck. It's uh, nice to be with you, and um, I'm happy to be the victim of your uh, new experiment with Mac Voices TV. This should be fun. Yeah, we're going to see uh, if we can't make this work and, and let the people know that as much as I plan to pick on you, it's it's all in good fun to some extent. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I've had a lot of people pick on me since that column was published. John, you've been here before on Mac Voices, and I want to make sure that the, the audience knows that you have plenty of credentials here uh, to know of which you, you speak or write. Give us a quick uh, overview of your background before we start digging into the iPad 2. Oh, my, uh, my academic and work background or yeah. just writing? Uh, no, your academic and work because you've, you've, you're not just somebody that has just written. You've actually done some of this stuff. Well, let's see. I started off as a United States Air Force officer. I was in the space track network uh, tracking satellites. Uh, I went to graduate school, worked on a master's and Ph.D. in astrophysics, relativity. Um, then I went to work for White Sands Missile Range doing combat modeling on a VAX system, uh, using all my physics experience and uh, computer modeling. That was uh, in SimScript. Uh, and then I got lured to uh, Denver in 1985 to work on uh, SDI, the Space Defense Initiative, and got more involved with uh, computers uh, and aerospace, astronautics, um, and then did a stint at the Oak Ridge National Lab for a while and learned all my Unix and, and networking, um, and then came back to Denver for a while and worked more for uh, Lockheed Martin Astronautics. And then I got an offer from Apple to work in science and technology marketing, in 2000, and I just leaped at the chance. I thought I would work for Lockheed Martin forever and retire with Lockheed Martin, but when Apple offered me a job to do science marketing and talk about the Unix aspects of Mac OS X, I went, all right, that's it. I'm in. <laughs> Well, that's a that's a pretty impressive set of credentials, and I I knew most of it. But oh, I, when I summer interned at NASA when I was in graduate school. Oh, okay. Worked so, on space shuttle simulators too. Forgot that. So so you have a, a quite a bit of tech cred. Uh, oh yeah. More than the yeah. average person. So with all of us drooling over the iPad two, you weren't quite as excited uh, as maybe some of us were. Why? Well, let me give you some background. You you, you know. Rumors dribbled out from suppliers, and we first heard about a high-resolution display, and then we found out, no, we weren't going to get that, probably till the iPad 3. And uh, we heard some other things that, that we thought might happen and, and didn't happen. And so I was kind of sizing up the situation before the iPad 2 was announced, and I was thinking to myself, what would surprise and delight me? Going back to the days when... Apple came out with products that we didn't know anything about, didn't suspect at all, um, like the iPhone. I remember sitting in, in the, what was it, Macworld 2007 in, in January, sitting next to Dave Hamilton, the publisher. Steve was showing us the iPhone going on and on. And I said, I turned to Dave and I said, I don't care how much it costs. He hasn't announced it. He's going to leave the cost. He's going to leave the consumer price to the end. I don't care. I don't care how much it costs. You know, it's just, I'm going to have an iPhone. And it turned out to be expensive, the first one, because <clears throat> there was no subsidi subsidization. But, um, you know, it was pretty darn cool. And so, having gone through this and having followed Apple for a long time, I thought, all right, so there's keen competition. I've been covering the Zoom, covering the, the Hewlett Packard announcement of the touchpad. And I thought, all right, everybody's on Apple's case. Everybody's coming out with a tablet. This is the year, as Steve Jobs, Steve Jobs said, this is the year of the copycats. So there's going to be some serious competition in 2011. And I thought, all right, so what Apple should do is come out with something that just disheartens the competition, just dismays them and demoralizes them. 
and, and really build. And I thought, well, they've got a year to do that, right? Everybody else had to start from scratch. They had to conceive the idea, figure out how they were going to compete, design the hardware, get the hardware built, integrate an operating system of their choice, whether it's Android, Honeycomb, or QNX, or um, uh, Palm OS, figure out how to integrate this all and get it. And they're almost ready to compete with the, uh, the iPad. And I thought, you know, Apple needs to really step up their game and be ready to compete. And so when I watched the, uh, well, actually, I listened to the, the presentation, um, I thought, you know, I don't believe Steve. This is, it could be redesigned internally, but in terms of, the, and it's much faster graphics, you know, it's going to feel great in your hand. Um, but I kind of felt like, given that they had an entire year to uh, do this, I wasn't really blown away. I thought, well, what did they think they had to do to up their game and stay ahead of the competition? You know, when, uh, when the competition doesn't know what they're doing and they kind of wander and they throw, they throw out specs and they, you know, you know, kind of throw things in to see what sticks, everybody says, oh, they have no vision, right? But when Apple doesn't do something like no stereo speakers or no higher resolution display, then everybody says, ah, oh, that's Steve's refined sense of minimalism. <laughs> <laughs> right? So, so, so people really kind of cut Apple some slack. And so I wrote this article about being disappointed, but I didn't really mean to use the word in the sense that the product is a disappointing effort. The iPad 2 is a great product. Now I'll buy one and I'll give my old one to my wife because she desperately wants the old one to read books. But I was just personally disappointed that it wasn't a bigger increment. It didn't step up more. Now, there's some new ones to that, too. So we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. So I wrote this article. I, looked, I, I published the spec chart. I probably shouldn't have done that because I think 95% of the readers looked at the title of the article, saw a spec chart, and jumped right to the comments. <laughs> and... And, and started and, and so if you look at the beginning of the article, it's the the teaser article on the homepage. Um, if you if you start from there, said Apple doesn't generally compete on product specifications. They they suppress things like they don't tell you what the RAM is in the iPads. They compete on applications and touch and feel and the quality of the product and the magical sense of the iPad. It, we all know that. So people read the title of the article and they look at the spec chart and they jump right in the comments and then they start lecturing me about how Apple doesn't compete on specs. And I'm going, well, yeah, I know, but it's okay. It's okay for me to be a little disappointed. You know, I wanted more and I explained why I wanted more. So that resulted in uh, almost a uh, hundred comments. You know, and you know how comments go. People start getting on me then they get on each other. Then it goes down a rabbit hole. You know? <laughs> but there was one comment that I thought was pretty good. And I reflected on that for a while. Um, one of the, the readers said, well, you know, Apple didn't really have to come out with a second generation that was a blow away. Because if they had done that, gone to extreme measures, like say a retina display, it would have raised the cost. And we're seeing how Apple's beating up on the competition by keeping the price low. Um, you know, I gave an iPad for Christmas to a friend's wife secretly, and he pitched in half, and I pitched in half. And, you know, that's pretty doable, you know, 250 bucks to pitch in, you know, half. When you start looking at really expensive things like seven or eight or $900 for some of these, you know, you, you can't do that. So gifting the iPad is something that's really popular. And Apple's got a real leg up on the competition, and they've got the retail stores, and they grab all the profit. They don't have to worry about bleeding off some profit to Verizon or to Best Buy or something like that. So Apple's got a competitive advantage there, and they can keep the price down. So this reader says, he says, well, you know, Apple thought that they didn't have to go to extreme measures, um, and they could keep the price down and further beat up on the competition through price. So I started thinking about that because Steve mentioned that in, in the keynote. You know, we want to make it, we don't want to build products just for rich people. And that's a good idea. I agree with that. But then I started thinking, 
well, you know, these tablets are so cool. You know, we're all so much in a hurry to move into the future. Wouldn't it be nice if we could have something that just blew us away? And, you know, you pay a little bit more, but it takes your breath away. You know, you're surprised and you're delighted. Um, uh, so, you know, it's kind of a wash in, in that sense. So I, I was prepared to be blown away like I was blown away with the iPhone. Uh, I was prepared to think that Apple needed to think far in advance and say, what are we going to be competing with in 2011? And we've seen the Zoom was a pretty serious piece of hardware. So I thought Apple was going to just go a little bit further. Now, I understand that, you know, because of resolution issues and software that you got to go up 2x. So it has, you have to double the screen in both dimensions. And that would be a very expensive display. And, of course, we've all read about some technical issues and how expensive that might have been. And now it's going to have to be deferred to the next version. That's okay, too. I was disappointed. I wanted it earlier. <laughs> so, so I wrote about my disappointment. I wrote about the fact that, um, you know, it didn't have stereo speakers. And people uh, in the comments were saying, well, John, do we really need stereo speakers? But I got to tell you a story about that. Um, I was doing some, I was paying some bills out of the kitchen table. So I, I wanted to play some music and I was kind of fussing with paperwork and I didn't want to wear earbuds or headphones or anything, get in my way. And I thought, well, you know, the iPad is the only iOS device that has a speaker, right? So I put the iPad down in front of me on the, on the kitchen table and I was running the, uh, the iPod section and I was running my music in mono, you know, and it was close enough to me that if, you know, really nice software uh, could, you know, accentuate the effect. Well, then somebody writes back in the comments, you know, more rabbit hole, uh, that it's supposed to be a multi-dimensional device and you can turn it any way. All right. So it doesn't make sense to have stereo speakers. Then another brilliant reader puts a note in there and says, ah, but there are, uh, there's one tablet computer coming out. It has three. And when you rotate it, it switches speakers. So, you know, it kind of all depends on what your expectations are and what you would like and how ambitious you would like Apple to be and how Apple has to, you know, both be very aggressive and beat up on the competition and yet not go overboard and price themselves out of the market. And personally, I was a bit disappointed. And people got on my case like, you're not entitled to be disappointed. You have to be, you know, a complete fan and you have to be totally sold down the river. You know? and, and there were some nuances in the article. You know, I'm looking at the article and I says, you know, don't get me wrong. I think the iPad 2 is a fabulous device and we'll add one to our family. But that didn't, that didn't matter. <laughs> well, it, it, it's funny, John, because I, I, I guess I had some of the same reaction when I read it. And knowing you, I, you know, I thought, okay, the, for my first thought, honestly, if it had been anyone else, I would have thought link bait. Uh, just, you know, just to, to pull people in right. to argue with it. But then right. I, I saw it was you that wrote it. It's like, okay, this has some credibility. And I went through and I thought, you know, I, I see your points. I don't agree with all of them. But the, the one thing that keeps getting missed, I think, in today's environment, and, and especially for the audience that you write for, that I produce these shows for, we are so technically oriented. We are so you know anxious for the device that does everything, everything we want. Mm -hmm. You know, we, you're right. We're anxious to move into the future. We forget that there is a business model that says you know we need to do something that will make people buy an iPad two from an iPad one, and frankly, at some point, buy an iPad three from an iPad two. Uh, Technology is going to take care of some of that. Just the evolution of what's available. But it's sort of natural, I think, from a business perspective to hold a few things back. And like, as you said, some of the readers pointed out, if they didn't have to put it into this model, would I have liked to have been blown away? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I, the one thing I personally think that is not being really appreciated and won't be until we all get our hands on it is this new chip. Because if it really is twice as powerful, twice as fast, we're going to see a lot of things that – I, developers, I believe, have been holding back on. Maybe the rest of us didn't know about it. Right. But we're going to have a lot right. more capabilities. The fact that you're going to be able to do so much more with iMovie now in this says something about that. Right. Well, you know, I, I often write articles from, from the heart. I'm very technical, but I'm also very 
uh, idealistic and, uh, you know, I've, I've written some fiction in the past. So, you know, sometimes I write articles that have a lot of nuance and they're not just 100% one direction or another. And I invite my readers to respond and think and roll ideas around in their head. I read an article a while back by Dan Frommer from Business Insider. He's one of my favorite writers. And he talked about how he stopped using his iPad altogether. His new favorite tool was his MacBook Air. And he went into some details about that. And it's the same kind of article. Um, you know, you read it and you go, yeah, I can understand that because Dan travels a lot. And he's a writer. And he's got to have a crisp, great keyboard. And he's got to have his tools. And in some cases, for content development, especially writing, unless you have a Zagmate or one of those special, you know, clamshells that has a keyboard inside. But even then, that's not a full-size keyboard. It's a little bit difficult to write two or 3,000 words on an iPad at one sitting. So um, I thought that was an interesting article, and I, I, I understand his point of view. And, you know, if I had a MacBook Air to take on travel, I probably would prefer to take that. Uh, and this was the same kind of article. I thought, well, you know, let's just see what people think. But you know, there's so much charged up emotion, and there's, there's so much feelings out there by you know, uh, testosterone challenged fellows that as soon as they see a headline like that, uh, and as soon as they start reading it, it's like, Oh, John's a traitor. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Come on guys, you know, gals, you know, I, I tell you what, there's 97, there's 95 comments or something so far today. I can't identify any of them that are women. I wonder what their reaction would have been. The fact that you just said gals, you may get the <laughs> comments right here, Sean. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. It's, it, 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 is, it is interesting to watch uh, the reaction to, to this. You know, and there's, there's my natural inclination to try to argue the point with you. Uh, you know, I, I look at it and I say, okay, it would have been nice. The one thing I really was sort of expecting and didn't get was a little more of a price drop. On the other hand, they don't need to drop the price. They may not be able to drop the price. Uh, uh, because look at the Zoom. I mean, the Zoom, you know that if that could have come out cheaper, they would have brought it out cheaper. Right. And they brought it out. And if you match up some of the key specs, not all, uh, you know, but some of the key specs, uh, the iPad still beats it at, at 800 bucks. Now, can you equip an iPad up above $800? Absolutely. Uh, but you have just that much more capable a machine. And you still have an entry-level iPad with just Wi-Fi that, as you said, is very affordable. I have to wonder if some of that isn't really focused on, on building the platform as a base as opposed to just selling this particular model, but putting an iPad of some kind, of some ca capability and capacity in more people's hands. Well, yeah, there's, there's nuances there on that, too. Uh, you know, a while back I wrote an editorial, you probably saw it, that said Apple should keep on selling the iPad 1 for less. Right. And lo and behold, they did that. But they did it in a kind of like closeout kind of fashion where, you know, you, you won't see it on the Apple Store as a featured product that's still in the mainstream. It's sort of like, you now here's a way to buy one for $100 off. And you could keep buying them until we run out. So that was a way of kind of positioning the product as, you know, older, you know, you pay a little less. They weren't trying to keep it in the mainstream on the same level as the iPad 2 and then use it as a bludgeon against the competition. Because, you know, sooner or later they're going to run out of them and it doesn't make any sense to make any more once they do. Um, and uh, uh, it, it kind of keeps out Apple's value proposition in sync. Speaking of the Zoom, I saw an, an ad today that it's going to be coming out for a much lower price in some places in the near future. And when you start with a high price like that for one product and then you lower it by a couple hundred bucks in this case, uh, maybe they were advertising the Wi-Fi only version. But it kind of looks like, you know, they're in a little bit of a panic and it kind of devalues the product and it looks like they're taking a loss, you know. If, if it were me, I would go ahead with the Zoom 1 and then say, okay, fine, this is great, and then figure out how to come out with a Zoom 2 that is a lower price and it makes it look like it was a you know a considered process. And that way you don't devalue the brand. So I'm getting ready to write an article about mistakes that uh, the competition's making, and that's just 
one more on my list of, of things that they're doing. John, given that you weren't blown away by it, and I know you you started out by saying that you plan to get an iPad too. Don't you think, though, that that this iPad heading into 2011, uh, and and at least for what we would expect would be a reasonable life cycle for this particular product, don't you still think this puts it above at least the specs we've seen for pretty well? You know, I wonder about that. Sometimes I get the feeling that Apple, through keen industrial espionage or or just having their ear to the railroad tracks or you know just just knowing what's going on through their parts suppliers and things like that nothing nothing illegal don't don't get me wrong on that accusing apple of espionage but you know there's ways of kind of figuring out just like we journalists do you know you listen to things and you figure things out competitive intelligence uh, i think that's what it is that's what it is um that apple probably surmised that there would wouldn't be anybody who could touch them, uh, at least in early 2011. Um, but you never know. Somebody could pull a rabbit out of the hat. Uh, you, know, you, you go to CES. Jeff Gammon went to CES and looked at all the iPads. I mean, all the tablet computers. And uh, he saw some that uh, some Asian suppliers wouldn't let him even touch. Uh, they weren't working. In some cases, if they were working, he wasn't allowed to play with it because they were just there to try to find a U.S. distributor for it. And they just wanted to you know, get in the face of potential distributors. And they weren't really interested in having a consumer look at it or talk about it. Um, but, you know, I, I think I've heard there's a, a Toshiba tablet that's supposed to be coming out, but I don't know much about it. Um, so I think the, the community is pretty much surmised that, you know, the only real competition is going to be the Zoom and the touchpad and the playbook. Um, but, but you never know. But You never, never know. But, you know, we only have one real competitor that's shipping right now, and that's the Zoom. There are a lot of things that are supposed to come out. There are a lot of things that are supposed to come out by now. And, and I, I realize I sound like an Apple fanboy and, and like some of the people in the comments, and that's not what I'm doing. I, I guess I'm looking at it realistically and saying if next week if the playbook ships then we can start to evaluate it yeah. but there are a lot of promises being made and there are a lot of people that have made promises in the past that haven't delivered well and that's that's the key point apple must have estimated based on their uh judgment of the industry that based on the state of the art of the technology available displays available components that nobody would be able to touch them through 2011 and that they would be safe until Christmas if they want to come out with an iPad 3 at Christmas or until March of 2012. They must have estimated that, you know, they're going to be okay. They'll be safe. The combination of 65,000 apps, the retail stores, the Apple quality brand, and the pricing would keep them in good position through 2011. Yeah, and as you said, that's a good business decision to make. But gee, I was, you know, I was just disappointed and sorry about it. <laughs> <laughs> we're all, we're all coming to the right back around to this. Is all about you, John. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I have readers, I have followers. You know, people want to know what I'm thinking. Um, you know, and I, I I do that every once in a while. You know, I kind of put my heart on my sleeve and I say, oh gosh, I was disappointed. You know, I wanted more. There were some little things that annoyed me, you know, but I tell you what, it doesn't buy you much. <laughs> let's, let's wrap this up and play a game between the two of sure. us. Because I, sure. I know what mine will be. If, if you could have one feature, one thing that you would have had done to the iPad 2 that would have made it for you or, or been the one thing that you really wanted to see, what would it have been? All right. Well, let me give you some preface on that. Um, the uh, A4 chip uh, was only capable of 720p. Um, uh, the best guesses I've seen are that the A5 chip can spill out 1080p like water through a faucet. All right, and you can get 1080p out through the HDMI port. On the iPad 1, 1024 by 768 was well synced to 720p, right? I mean, it's almost exactly a 720p spec. 768 by 1024, just a little off. When you jump to a processor and guts that's capable of outputting 1080p, then maybe you should have a screen that's 1080p so you don't have to 
fiddle with the pixels. You know, you can do one-to-one on the pixels. But now when they display 1080p on the iPad 2, they're going to have to have to do a, a scaling algorithm to scrunch it down. Now, I'm aware of the fact that it's going to be very hard to see the pixels because when you're, when you're the device is that small. The pixels are much closer together than they are on a TV that's eight feet away. I'm aware of that. But still, technically, it seemed to me like a 1080p device on that size screen was just seemed to be kind of technically out of sync. And I wouldn't be surprised if there were tablets in the future that you know were 12 inches or were 1, 1.6, 16 by 10 in aspect ratio and capable of displaying full 1080p. So in that respect, I was kind of technically disappointed being the nerd that I am. And so if there was one spec I would have liked to see on the iPad 2, it would have been a retina display. Yeah, that, that's a good one. Uh, and I think it would have made a lot of people happy. It also would have probably driven the price up. The one thing... But how much? Do we know how much? No. Would it have been 50 bucks? 100 200 Yeah, no, we don't. We, yeah, we would have been able to absorb 50 you know? Yeah, yeah. The one thing I, I, I've been surprised, and I guess it's strictly a power issue, but I really would like to see wireless Bluetooth syncing come to the iPad and the iPhone. And I'm, I'm just a little surprised that we haven't seen more of that as much as Steve hates cables. Uh, yes. I, I know a lot of people gripe about the fact that this is the iPad is, the, as Steve said, the post-PC device, and yet you still have to plug it into a PC to, uh, to, to use it or to fire it up. But... Right. That and that affects gifting. You know, I would, I'd love to give one to my mom. Uh, like with Dave Letterman, my mom's back in Indiana. And, uh, <laughs> and, and I'd love to give her one so we can do chats like this, you know, an email. But she doesn't have a computer. So that kind of scratches that. Yeah. 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 It's, that's the one thing, though, that I, that I do wish, you know, not, not the, I, I don't have a problem with the tethering to manage things. In fact, I personally think that that makes it easy. But I, I would like to have the option for just the casual, you know, I, I bring the iPad home, put it next to my, my, one of my Macs yeah. so that it will load the, the day's podcasts that have downloaded, that kind of thing. Well, there were rumors about that. There were rumors that Apple's going to come out with a cloud service where you could, you know, more fully do that. Yeah. And you could buy the iPad and you would never need to have a computer and you do all your storage and, and syncing with the cloud. <clears throat> That's another one of those cases where when Apple doesn't do it, it's because that's the minimalist philosophy or the technology is not ready yet or the, the data center in North Carolina is not fully fired up. And so, you know, we'd like to see those things, but when they don't do it, um, we're disappointed. Not in the sense we think can't, Apple's failed. We're just disappointed in the sense that, you know, things aren't happening quicker. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's going to be very, very interesting to see. That's one thing, though, that could be added, John, I think, later with with no real changes to the iPad 2. If that service becomes available, okay, you've got a couple software updates, boom, 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 you're up and running. Yeah. yeah. Well, another reason for my disappointment is, is that my wife really wants the old iPad. Okay, so then we roll around and, uh, you know, I'm using this iPad 2, you know, and then here we are, either Christmas or March of 2012, and Apple rolls out the new iPad 3 with the Retina display, and I'm going, holy crap, how many iPads do I have to buy? <laughs> Jeff Gannett made that comment, I think, uh, during the Mac jury. The perception of the people is different. We want our MacBooks to be updated very frequently, and a year between MacBook Air updates is an eternity. But when Apple comes out with a new iPad, we got to have it, but we, we went, oh, no, wait, wait, it's, it hasn't been that long. You know, I don't want to buy a new one yet. It's, <laughs> it's, that's a very interesting phenomenon. Well, it just seems like no matter what Apple does, somebody's not happy. It's either not, yeah. not enough or it's too much. It's not soon enough or it's too soon. Yeah. It, it's, it's a devil position to be in, but with the number of iPads they've been selling, the number of MacBooks, you know, just the quarterly results, it's, it's hard to argue with the logic. Yeah. Well, their goal is forty million to sell this year. You know, that's their stated goal. Yeah. So I was doing a calculation in the day. Everybody says that uh, Apple's only uh, you know sold four, sold fourteen point eight million iPads in nine months of two thousand ten. So I was thinking, well, you know, if their goal was forty million in two thousand eleven, they're they're probably going to meet that goal, which is um, three million a month. And now we're into March, 
So that's six million that sold this year, plus the fifteen they sold last year. That's twenty one million. But I, I haven't seen people use that number. I'm the only person I know who's using the twenty one million estimate. Everybody's still using the two thousand ten number. I don't know why. Uh, seems obvious. John, you, we got to get you back here more. It's it's interesting to talk. I mean, even if it is all about you, it's. <laughs> Yes, but I'm not as distinguished as Don McAllister. <laughs> you have been listening to the Mac Jury, haven't you? Well, you, don't have, you don't have the accent. I mean, it's it's hard to compete with Don's accent. Yeah, that's that's true. <laughs> yeah, John. That's why, I'm, that's why I'm in love with Emily Blunt. <laughs> <laughs> okay, she we, just sounds so smart. <laughs> we're not going to get into true confessions here. <laughs> Tell everyone where they can find out more about what you do and uh, where they can read more of the things that you write. Very good. I am a uh, uh, senior editor for the Mac Observer, www.macobserver, all one word, dot com. And there you'll find my colleagues Ted Landau and the funny Jeff Gamut and the amazing uh, Dave Hamilton and John Brown with their Mac Geek Gab, their, their podcast, which is amazing each week. And uh, you'll find my crazy machinations as well. But oh my God! Please don't forget Brian Chaffin. We'll be, we'll oh. be in trouble. Oh yeah. <laughs> He's been doing accents on us. This morning we did the entire conference call, and, and Brian was doing his New Jersey accent, and he had us all rolling on the floor laughing. Oh, thank it was you! Amazing. I can't, I can't <laughs> wait to talk to Brian. Again. He's a master of that. Oh, have him do the Steve Ballmer impersonation. Oh yeah, he he does Steve Ballmer. It cracks me up. Yeah, yeah, we've we've had him do Ballmer on on the show, and it is okay. I, I agree with you. Very good, John. Thanks so much for the time. We'll uh, we'll do it again soon. Was a pleasure. Thank you very much, folks. I'll have links in the show notes to uh, to, to everything that we've talked about here. Obviously, to uh, to John's column. Uh, to follow him on Twitter, to follow me on Twitter, to see everything else that we're doing at the Mac Voices Group. Uh, Hopefully we can keep you entertained and informed at the same time. Until the next time, I'm Chuck Joyner. As always, thanks for watching. Mac Voices TV is part of the Mac Voices Group and a member of Mac Level 10.